Today's scripture reading will be 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up uh, in the truths of, fa of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. morning. We're glad that you are here today. We appreciate your presence with us as we worship God. I also want to thank those who directed our minds in worship. They all did a great job, and we appreciate that so very much. The first question that the Bible records was ever asked was asked in the early dawn of history in the Garden of Eden. It was a question asked by Satan of Eve as he began his first temptation. It's found in Genesis chapter 3 in the very first verse, where the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Through this first question, Satan is trying to introduce doubt into the mind of Eve with regard to the Word of God and whether it can be trusted. In addition, his apparent motive was to cause her to view what God commanded as too restrictive. The ESV records the question as, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Similarly, the NIV says, Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree of the garden. Obviously, Satan is wanting a negative answer. No, that's not what God said. Surely, God didn't really say that. He didn't really mean that. That's the seed he was planting in the so seed of her, the soil of her mind. The question was designed to leave Eve to question God. In an attempt to influence her to view God's Word as something to be looked down on to the point of not having to obey it. And that's a similar tactic that Satan has been using ever since. And many people even today are falling for the same line today. And they're doing the same thing that Eve did. For example, many make the claim today that the Bible was just written by men. Or that it's been translated so many times down through the years that we really don't know if we have the true meaning. Or the Bible is filled with so many contradictions that we simply can't trust it. And the list goes on and on. Has God really said this? Other people accept the Bible as being from God, but affirm that its teaching is simply too restrictive. They read the Bible and what God requires, and they ask the same question that Satan did. Is this really what God said? Is that really what He expects of us? Surely that can't be what God really means. We must understand, however, that the Word of God is both trustworthy and authoritative. We shouldn't fall for what Satan was suggesting with that first question. God has revealed His will and He demands that we obey what He said. What the Bible teaches is the basis of everything we do in Christianity. With that in mind, let's examine several specific areas for which doctrine is the foundation. It's vital in our walk before God that we recognize the place that doctrine must have in our lives as Christians. In order to do so, we need to first understand some fundamental things about doctrine. First, we need to understand the significance of doctrine. What does that word mean? 
Well, it's important that we know what is meant by the Bible with the term doctrine. The word occurs 30 times in the New Testament and typically refers simply to teaching. It's used as a noun most often. More specifically, it refers to a collective body of established teaching. And so it encompasses the entire arrangement of teaching. In 1 Timothy 6.1, the Bible says, Let as many as are servants under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and the doctrine be not blasphemed. That word doctrine here references the message taught. He's not talking about the act of teaching. He's saying here is the message, that body of truth. In Titus 2.1, Paul told Timothy to speak thou the things which befit the sound doctrine. Timothy was to speak with words that would accord with this body of instruction, in this case, spiritual instruction. Whatever he taught the content was to be in line with the whole of God's Word. And so the significance of this term in the Bible is that collective body of spiritual truth. And therefore, by contrast, false doctrine would be any unscriptural or extra-biblical collection of teaching. And stressing the fact that doctrine includes the entire body of truth we demonstrate our opposition to the modern way of thinking that denies part of doctrine. In religious circles today, references is sometimes made to what is being called core doctrine. There's a movement underway that places great emphasis on doctrine, but only we have to agree on what is only core doctrine such as the deity of Christ, but other teachings, such as how we choose to worship, whether with instruments of music or not, that shouldn't be a reason for us to disagree because that's not core doctrine. And so the claim is made that there are some major doctrines that all men must believe, but then there are others that are minor doctrines that we can disagree on and yet maintain unity. It's kind of a don't sweat the small stuff attitude. But if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew 23, Jesus is pronouncing a series of woes specific to the scribes and the Pharisees. And the Bible records in verse 23 that Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye tithe mint and anise and cumin, and have left undone the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faith. And so from this, people have clung to the word weightier matters and proposed as long as we hold to these important parts of the Bible, then the other parts don't really matter. The problem with the view is Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't say that they should only focus on these weightier matters and forget about tithing the spices. The verse continues with Jesus saying, but these ye ought to have done, and not to have left the other undone. He says they were focused on tithing, which he says they ought to have done, but their problem was they were leaving undone the weightier matters. We might say they weren't sweating the big stuff, and that was the problem. We cannot pick and choose which elements of doctrine we will hold to and which we have the right to ignore. We must hold to the entire body of truth. Another thing we need to understand is the source of doctrine. We hinted at it already, but let's be absolutely firm in this regard. Our doctrine is the truth that has been revealed by God. It's the divinely originated message that has been written down and compiled into what we call today the Holy Bible. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness. That verse is very clear that what is inspired of God is what has been written down. 
The NASB says every scripture is God-breathed. Now, if you breathe out from your body, whose breath is that? No one but yours. And when God breathed out, that is his message. He is the source of it. What the Bible penman wrote down was not simply their opinions, their own ideas, but the very words that God wanted recorded. Second Peter chapter 1 also teaches this. After pointing out in verse 16 that they did not follow cunningly devised fables, the writer says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of private interpretation. For no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spake from God being moved by the Holy Spirit. God ensured that the message that these men wrote down was exactly what he wanted written down. The books that were written by God's inspiration were immediately recognized as being from God and therefore authoritative. The recipients of those original documents knew the writers, and they knew that what they wrote was from God. Because of that divine source for our doctrine, we must also recognize the singularity of doctrine. There are not multiple teachings, all of which are equally valid, even though they might contradict one another. There is only one body of truth. With regard to the Bible, not only is its doctrine absolute truth, it is the only spiritual truth. There is only one doctrine. Truth is always exclusive in nature. For example, there is a reason why the math teacher We'll look at 2 plus 2 equals 7 and mark that false. Why? Isn't that a good answer? No, it's not a good answer. Why not? Because truth is exclusive. There's only one correct answer. Well, isn't that a bit restrictive? Yes, it is. If you're concerned about what is right. And so it doesn't matter how firmly a student believes the answer is seven or how sincere he is in putting down that answer. The fact is his belief doesn't change reality. And the same is true with regard to spiritual doctrine. There are many man-made teachings that are subjective, but there is only one objective standard to which all men are accountable. And while a man may hold with the greatest fervor what his denomination may teach and be absolutely sincere in his religious practice, if that belief is not found in the Bible, it's simply not the truth. Is that too restrictive? Not at all. If you're concerned about reality, his belief doesn't change reality. And so we must turn to the scriptures, the written word of God, to find out the doctrine to which we must hold. Because there is only one. Look with me, if you would, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We find a number of parallel ideas with regard to doctrine, all of which express the singular nature of truth. In fact, Paul begins with a warning with regard to other teaching. He says, If any man teacheth a different doctrine, and consenteth not to sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is puffed up knowing nothing, but doting about questionings and disputes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. So if anyone teaches a different doctrine, it is to be rejected. And with those things in mind, with an idea of what is this doctrine the Bible talks about, let's continue by looking at the great importance the doctrine has. It is the basis for all that we believe and practice in the church. In the first place, the Bible shows us that doctrine is the foundation for human salvation. God didn't leave it up to us to figure out what we wanted to do to obtain his forgiveness. And so he has revealed in the Bible the means through which we can be saved. In a basic sense, we must follow the doctrine that has been given to mankind. That's true of our initial salvation and becoming a Christian. The only way anyone can learn about 
God's plan of salvation is by looking into the Scriptures. We must learn what God has said is necessary for redemption. And that's why in Ephesians 1 verse 3, Paul speaks about the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. It is through the gospel that God calls us unto salvation, as 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 says. Most of us are probably familiar with the words of Romans 1 verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Did you notice it didn't say they are? It says it. There is only one, and this is God's power to save. It is the gospel. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Paul reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 that from a babe thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The sacred writings are the same documents that we saw called Scripture in verse 16. That is God breathed. Therefore we cannot turn to any other teaching with regard to our salvation, we must go to the Scriptures. Regardless of how men may hold it up, no writing of man is capable of bringing salvation from sin. There are no human philosophies that have that power. The teaching through which we learn about God's loving offer of forgiveness is through the Bible, and the Bible only. In other words, we have to go to the doctrine. Furthermore, doctrine is also the basis for our continued salvation as Christians. Although we have become obedient to the gospel through obedience from the heart to that form of doctrine or that standard of teaching, as Romans 6.17 says, it's possible for us to lose our salvation. The question in Hebrews 2 is absolutely rhetorical. To his Christian audience, the writer says in verses 2 and 3, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which having at the first been spoken through the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard? It is vital to our continued salvation that we don't neglect it. John writes of the importance of this in 2 John. John is also writing to Christians. And he says, Look to yourselves that you lose not the things which ye have wrought, but that ye receive a full reward. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching the hath the same hath both the Father and the Son. This is very serious indeed, isn't it? Verse 10 says, And if anyone come unto you and bring not this teaching, receive him not into your house and give him no greeting. For he that giveth him greeting partaketh in his evil work. In verse 9, the King James Version uses the word doctrine and says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. We need to follow the words of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, where Timothy is told this, Take heed unto thyself and to thy doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. It's possible for us to be like those about which Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He writes in verse 3 and says, For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but, having itching ears, will heap to themselves teachers after their own lusts. Now he's writing to a particular time in history, but are not those words applicable in our day as well? Are there not men who do not endure the sound doctrine, but they want to hear what they want to hear? 
They will not endure the sound doctrine. That means they will refuse to listen to God's message. Verse 4 says they will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside unto fables. We must continue to listen to the sound doctrine. Notice in verse 4 it's simply called the truth. In the second place, the Bible shows us the doctrine is the foundation for acceptable worship. And by acceptable, what I mean is acceptable to God. In our day, many people are perverting the true worship of God and following their own wishes. And so they bring into the assembly whatever they want or whatever they think other people may want. But in doing so, they abandon the doctrine of the New Testament. They ignore what God has revealed that He wants and replaced it with what they want. Look in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus used very clear language that addressed that problem in His day. In Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 6, He said, You have made void the Word of God because of your tradition. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. When men teach the wrong doctrine, that invalidates their worship. Men both in man-made churches and sadly some places in the church of Christ, they have progressively moved away from the truth. And they've ignored the authorized pattern that God has left that is found in the Bible. Jacob Rutledge is from the church in Dripping Springs, Texas, and he has written this. An increasing amount of denominations are growing farther and farther from the shore of biblical teaching. This departure creates a vacuum that is inevitably filled with emotionalism. Experience-driven churches which laud testimonials, stories, and pop culture over Scripture. The result of this transition is witnessed in the worship and lifestyles of their congregants, lives that are more conformed to the world than they are to Christ. The church must understand the importance of proclaiming, cultivating, and defending an environment that values doctrine. He's absolutely right in that. With regard to worship, God will not accept worship that is not prescribed by Him in the Scriptures. He hasn't left that up to our judgment. He could have done that. He's done that in other areas. But in this area, he is specific. And so we must conform to his commands. The early church was committed to following what God gave to the apostles. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the text says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice the first thing mentioned is the apostles' doctrine. It's called the Apostles' Doctrine not because it originated with them, but they were the means through which God disseminated that truth. It was this teaching that the early Christians held to. The ESV says they devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching. Notice that also included in this verse is a clear reference to worship when it speaks of the Lord's Supper. Although not included in some of the English translations, the definite article here is found twice. It is a reference to the breaking of the bread. In regard to the article before the word bread, Wayne Jackson notes the article indicates that a special bread is under consideration. That is the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 verse 7, the breaking of bread. And 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the bread which we break. Likewise, Vincent observes, this is used to designate the celebration of the Lord's Supper. This, by the way, is in contrast to the breaking of bread that references a common meal found later in the text. In verse 46, Paul writes, 
of the Christians that breaking bread at home, they took their food with gladness and singleness of heart. In this case, as Albert Barnes rightly notes, here meat, as the King James says, means all kinds of sustenance, that which nourished them. And the use of this word proves that it does not refer to the Lord's Supper, for that ordinance is nowhere represented as designed for an ordinary meal or to nourish the body. In addition, in this verse, we also have the article found in front of the word prayers also. They were not simply devoted to engaging in prayer, but it speaks of the prayers, which many scholars hold references the public prayers that took place during the worship service. And so in matters of worship, the early church did not bring in innovations. They held fast to the doctrine. And today we have the obligation to do the same. Our worship should be conducted with strict adherence to the word of God so that it is acceptable worship before God. In the third place, the Bible shows us that doctrine is the foundation for everyday living. What we do comes from what we believe. Our conduct always springs from our understanding. And so there is a direct correlation actually in every area of our life between what we hold to be true and how we behave. As a simple example, imagine two people who see a valuable diamond ring laying on a table unattended. The one man, an atheist, holds there is no absolute right or wrong. There is no objective moral standard. He believes he can do with whatever he can get away with. The other person is a Bible-believing Christian, and he knows what the Bible says, and he believes stealing is a sin against God. Now, your mind can fill in the actions that each man would take, can't they? Your mind knows that there is a completely different action based on their beliefs. Bible doctrine will promote righteous living. It is therefore not some nebulous abstract content that has no connection to our lives. Rather, it is absolutely relevant and practical. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 1. As Paul writes here, he writes in this regard, and notice the wide array of sins that are listed in this context. 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 9. As knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and unruly, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for abusers of themselves with men, for men stealers, for liars, for false swearers, and if there be any other thing contrary to the sound doctrine, according to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Paul addresses these various sins and then says, if there be anything else contrary to the sound doctrine, Sin is what is contrary to sound doctrine. And so Christians will keep themselves from these things in their everyday lives. Why? Because of their belief. And their belief will mold their behavior. Our lives need to be governed by what the Bible teaches. Whether it relates to our marriages, our finances, our recreation, whatever the area, a desire to please God is going to mold how we live. We're going to be directed by the doctrine. And so as Christians, we're called to a new way of life in Christ. Paul directs us in Ephesians 4 verse 22 to put away as concerning your former manner of life, the old man that waxeth corrupt after the lusts of deceit, but instead be renewed in the spirit of your mind. As Christians, all of us have a former manner of life. What does that word former imply? It means we don't live that way anymore. As Christians, the doctrine has changed how we live every day. 
being renewed in the spirit of our mind, we have put away that old man and his doings. And so we don't live the way we used to live. We don't live the way the world lives. In Philippians 2, verse 15 and 16, Paul writes that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you're seen as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. Notice in verse 16, not only do we live in accordance to the doctrine ourselves, but we also hold forth the word of life to others. We strive to bring this truth, this doctrine, this teaching to the world. In addition, we stand in opposition to every false teaching that would condemn the souls of those that would follow it. In Titus 1 verse 9, although specifically speaking to elders, every member of the church should strive to do what is found there. In Titus 1 9, Paul writes, holding to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, that he may be able to ex exhort in the sound doctrine and to convict the gainsayer. When Paul says holding to the faithful word, there are two ways that could be taken. It can either mean holding to in the sense of cleaving or holding firmly to something, or it can mean to hold against, such as withstanding one who opposes the doctrine. And both of those would fit the context, since the verse speaks of both exhorting in the sound doctrine, but also convicting the gainsayer. But we are holding to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, the doctrine that we may be able to exhort in the sound doctrine and convict the gainsayer. It is strange that even when men understand what doctrine really is, that it is the teaching and the scope of God's truth, some view it as unnecessary or even unattainable. But it is far from that. Doctrine forms the foundation upon which all that we do to become Christians, and all that we do once we are Christians is based. If we fail to recognize the importance of doctrine in Christianity, then we will fail to do and to be what God expects. Without doctrine, we would be just aimlessly wandering around through life, having no knowledge of how to obtain and to maintain our salvation. We would not know how to properly worship God. We would not know how to live our lives every day in the world. And so rather than dismissing doctrine, we should thank God that he has blessed us with revealing his will to us because his will is the truth. And only in scriptures can we find the teaching that we need to live as God demands. We cannot change the doctrine. It is the fixed will of God. It is God's unchanging truth. However, according to Titus 2, verse 10, through how we live, we can adorn the doctrine of, our, of God our Savior in all things. Regardless of our station in life, physically speaking, we can, as one version says, make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. That should be our goal as Christians as we live every day. If you believe the Bible doctrine, the question for you is, have you obeyed that doctrine in order to obtain salvation? If not, we urge you to do that. And again, we don't just make things up. We go to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say that I need to do to obtain God's forgiveness? And the Bible reveals that. We can read through the book of Acts and find how those early Christians became such. If you have done that, but you're not living so as to make the doctrine attractive in every way, we urge you to make that change and to live as God has desired for us, has revealed to us, and demands that we live as Christians. How is your life? Is the doctrine your foundation for what you believe and what you do every day? If not, why not make that change? And if there needs to be a change in your spiritual state before God, follow the teaching 
that God has revealed in the Bible and make that change even right now as together we stand and sing. Will you come?